started. So good morning again, everyone, and, and thanks for attending this webinar. My name is Colin Anderson, and I'm the general manager here at Capiche. In today's webinar, we'll be having a look at the HP Records Manager SharePoint integration. The HP Records Manager SharePoint integration provides a two-way integration between SharePoint and Records Manager. I'm pleased to have one of Capiche's technical consultants, John Grundy, joining me to present today's webinar. How are you today, John? Good, Colin. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. So, well, without uh, any further ado, I'm going to hand over to John, who's going to take us through today's presentation. Thanks, John. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'll start by providing a bit more background on myself. I started working with Trim back in Tower Software headquarters in Canberra almost a decade ago. Since then, I've worked with HP when Tower was acquired in 2008. Then I have worked with um, uh, worked on several SharePoint integration projects over the years and have worked with SharePoint since 2003, if you remember when it was called MOSS 2003. So this webinar is intended to be a follow-on from my article in the IDM magazine where I describe some of the history of the integration. I also wrote about how the new integration of the, uh, the new version of the integration in HPRM 8.2 solves many of the previous issues uh, organizations found with both products and how the app model and management rules provide greater potential for seamless compliance. So we'll get to see this in action later in the webinar. All right, just going back a slide. Okay, so for those for those who have used the used or implemented the integration previously, you'll be able to relate to some of the emojis on screen. Uh, working with a large application such as SharePoint, and sorry, jumping ahead again, working with such a large application such as SharePoint, and with all the variables that different organisations bring, there have been various levels of success over the years and bringing the solution into production environments has been pretty challenging. These challenges are becoming a thing of the past with a full redevelopment of the integration in Records Manager and an improved integration model in SharePoint 2013. The timeline on screen is a simplified history of where it all started and where we are today. So around 2003-2004, Unique World Software developed third-party integration uh, called the TIPS SharePoint Connector. Around 2007, Tower Software asked Jamie Tilbrook to work for them, ultimately bringing across the integration and provided it as an optional module in Trim Context 6, and it was called the Trim Context SharePoint Integration, or TCSI. Around 2008 to 2010, Hewlett Packard acquired Tower Software and eventually renamed the product to HP Trim, uh, launching HP Trim 7, and with this TCSI was redeveloped as the HP Trim SharePoint integration. Then from 2010 to 2014, the product was more widely adopted with HP Trim 7.3 and SharePoint 20. So th this is where a lot of projects actually launched in production, in a production capacity. Uh, later, later during this period, Microsoft also developed a new app integration model for SharePoint 2013 and HP Records Manager 8 was released with a complete rebuild of the integration in 8.1. Now, here in 2015, HPRM 8.2 was released and the SharePoint integration, the 2013 integration, is the most capable release to date. So that's why I've got a big smiley face at the end there. So why is SharePoint governance and compliance so difficult? Now, take note of the dictionary definition on this slide. If you have used SharePoint in your organisation for any length of time, this is often how the environment ends up. If you're not familiar with the SharePoint structure, this will be explained in the coming slides. Okay. So let's take a quick look at where the content actually is stored in SharePoint. Just to set a baseline understanding of this, consider the dotted line as the SharePoint environment. SharePoint supports the concept of sites, and sites allow you to logically group together information that is related in some way. SharePoint can have many sites, typically related in a hierarchical structure. If you, use, if you have used SharePoint in your organisation before, this would typically be your top-level company intranet site, then subsites for HR, finance, IT, and so on. 
Now back to a single site. Sites can have lists and you can have many lists on a site. If you have used SharePoint before, then you have used lists. Document libraries are lists, discussion boards are lists, calendars are lists. These are just a few examples of what lists can be. And within a list, a list contains list items. In the case of a document library, the documents are list items. This is the same with discussion posts, calendar entries and so on. They are all list items. So when we are talking about the content in SharePoint, it is the list items that you need to consider. That's the content. So back to the problem. With the great capabilities that SharePoint provides to create site structures with lists on them, comes an issue where content generation grows in a snowball effect. If not controlled, many organisations find that things can rapidly get out of control. They find that the user-empowered nature of SharePoint means that sites and lists get created all over the place. Often these are forgotten about or abandoned, but still remain in SharePoint, causing challenges for the IT department maintaining SharePoint and ensuring it performs well. Traditionally, SharePoint is managed by IT, but how can the IT department identify problem areas? And worse still, how can they determine which content could be removed? So this should really be the responsibility of information managers, compliance officers and records officers. This is the chaos I referred to at the start of the presentation. Now from a records management perspective, this provides somewhat of a dilemma or a management paradox. SharePoint users love arranging content how they want to use it, creating it on an ad hoc basis, so you end up with content all over SharePoint. Whereas best practice records management principles dictate that you should use an organised, shallow, container-based structure. All records that are related from a compliance perspective are located in containers, and this provides record context. So things like retention schedules and security applied to the container, rather than the records themselves. So if we look at the problem we are trying to solve, it can be summarised as how should SharePoint content be managed, what content in SharePoint needs to be managed, and when should that content be managed. Starting with the how, the problems that we need to try and solve are firstly the management paradox. How do we fit a chaotic structure into a nice organised flat structure? That and that structure is the one that records managers want. When we manage content, what do we need to capture? The metadata, the document, both. What relationship is there between the content in SharePoint, uh, a SharePoint column, to a value in a field on a record in Trim? And is there a, a relationship between the content type in SharePoint and the record type required in HPRM? If we manage content, what do we leave behind in SharePoint? Do we remit? Do we remove it or do we leave it in place? When content is managed, what do we let the users do? Should they be able to do, uh, still be able to use the full functionality of SharePoint with it? And if we're getting rid of content from SharePoint, how do users find if they need it? Uh, how, do, how do users find it if they need to? So the how gives us a lot to think about. Fortunately, this is where Records Manager 8.2 integration really shines and we'll get to that soon. So how do, you, how do you decide what SharePoint content needs to be a record? Uh, because obviously this, this is a question not just with SharePoint, but uh, just all your business information. Um, what is a record? Most organisations will, will agree on record definitions such as evidence of a business transaction, anything that makes a decision, um, any content that's not of a personal nature and so on. But that is about where the agreement stops. So what constitutes a record can vary widely from one organisation to another. Therefore, a one-size-fits-all definition is never going to be suitable. Using an organisation's rules for determining what should be a record, who in the organisation should actually be able to make that determination? Uh, can these rules then be automated? And how do we make sure the rules or policies have been applied correctly so the content is actually compliant? 
what types of SharePoint content do we need to consider? Do we just look at the document-based content? So do we only want to capture documents from document libraries? Or do we also consider capturing the metadata only content such as the discussion boards, calendar items and, and announcements and so on? And lastly, what about the content that is, isn't going to be a record? Do we need to provide options to clean this up as well? So once you've decided on what should be a record, you need to consider at what point this content uh, becomes a record. So, so when does it become a record? Let's take a look at the information life cycle. This starts when content is created and ends when the content is ultimately destroyed. So anyone that's used Records Manager or, or done any disposal at a higher capacity would understand that there's a, a, a date when the record becomes into existence and a point when you stick it in the shredder. But what determines when the content can be destroyed? There are a host of things including industry and state specific legislation as well as internal policies and perhaps a litig litigation activity means that the content cannot yet be destroyed. So there's a lot of rules determining when uh, the destruction can occur. Now when we talk about SharePoint, the life cycle can be broken into two distinct parts. The SharePoint life cycle starts when the content is created in SharePoint and ends when it is deleted in SharePoint. So that's the SharePoint life cycle. The compliance life cycle starts when a record is created and ends when that record is destroyed. These two parts of the life cycle are not the same thing and they must be treated differently. If we look at what many sites with both SharePoint and Trim do with their content, so this is what I typically see in most organisations where they have no integration or they have a manual process where they're dragging content out from a library and then into Trim, users will create content and at some point it is removed from SharePoint, therefore finishing the SharePoint lifecycle, and it is put into Trim or Records Manager to live out the remaining lifecycle. Now there are some big issues with this approach. Using an example piece of content, let's consider that the legislation says that this content should be destroyed one year after it's created. But in this scenario, the content has been sitting in SharePoint for two years before it came a record. The problem is that this content could have been destroyed a year earlier, and because the organisation held on to this for two years before even making it a record, they have held on to the content for a year longer than they needed to, and potentially another year or more after that. This information could leave them exposed in a litigation or freedom of information request and so on. So you can see halfway through this two year period, the content should have been destroyed, but any period after that, you're actually exposed. Now what we tend to see in organisations with mature, mature records management practices or if using the new SharePoint integration, uh, is trigger-based records management. So in this case, the content is created in SharePoint, then at some point, something triggers the creation of a record. It could be that a certain period of time has elapsed or the value of a field um, in a SharePoint column matches our criteria. If we look at what should happen following this exam example, then uh, when we're using the integration, it would bring an end to the SharePoint lifecycle as the content would also be removed from SharePoint. The result is that the content would only be kept Kept, be kept for one year and that period of unnecessary exposure is avoided. Lastly though, it is important to, re to reflect on why we have a problem. So as fantastic as SharePoint is as an ECM platform, it is not a governance and compliance flat platform. Uh, that's a question I often get asked by SharePoint administrators is why can't we just use SharePoint? So the problem is it does not differentiate between the two parts of the information life cycle and as a result content is retained in SharePoint long after it is considered useful. If legislation says that a piece of content needs to be retained for 10 years, then it will sit in SharePoint for 10 years, even though people lost interest in it 9 years, 10 months ago. So this means higher storage costs as well as stale content cluttering SharePoint and detracting from its ease of use and of course that chaos I mentioned earlier. 
So now that we understand the problem, let's talk about how we solve it. Starting with how we manage content, so what we do with the documents or list items. If we go back several slides, we know that if we want to manage the content of SharePoint, we really need to be talking about these list items. At the core of how the integration works is the concept of managing a list item. This means creating a record in Records Manager to represent the list item, then keeping the two in synchronization. If the list item is modified, then the record is updated. If the record is updated, uh, the list item is updated as well. And remember, once the list item is managed, the HPRM record is the authority. So you can see when we manage the list item, the record is created and the two are kept in sync. Let's look more closely at what happens during management. If we consider a metadata only list item, such as a discussion post or calendar item, when we manage the list item, the metadata is captured on the record. In all cases, the integration always captures the metadata. So that's often a concern with uh, the integration as well, is what, what does it keep? What does it save against the record? So, so remember that the metadata is always captured. In the case where the list item has a document, be it a document in a document library or an attachment to a list item, while managed, the document only resides in SharePoint. It is not copied to the record. So this is the this answers a common question I get of where the document or the file exists uh, while the content is managed. Does the in integration duplicate storage requirements and so on? So with Records Manager 8.2 and the new integration, the answer is no, there's no duplication of the content at this point. There's the metadata component saved against the record, but the document is saved in the SharePoint store. So it is only when the list item is relocated that the document is captured in Records Manager. So during a, the, relo the relocate process, the document is copied to the record, then the list item is deleted. So during the relocate, the document is copied across and the list item disappears. This also applies to the archive process and if someone tries to delete a managed list item from SharePoint. During record destruction, the document is simply deleted from SharePoint. There is no need to copy it just for, for it to be deleted. Now, I've mentioned manage before. Manage is one of four core actions that, in, that the integration has. As we have seen, managing content is in-place management. The content is still editable and is still surfaced through SharePoint. The next feature is the finalized process, which manages the content if it is not already managed uh, and also finalizes it at the same time. The record then makes the item read only in SharePoint. The relocate process manages the content if it is not already managed, then removes it from SharePoint. The end user perceives it as moving from SharePoint to HPRM and it's still an active record. The archive process relocates the item and finalizes the record. So you do not have to go through all four processes like going around a clock here. You can start at any point depending on your requirements. So keep in mind these four core actions can be applied to individual items, multiple items, lists, sites, and so on. We talked about the management paradox earlier. How do we get a chaotic structure into a shallow container-based one? With the integration settings, Records management options provide configuration options to, to determine where content goes in HPRM. So that what that means is on each individual library or site, site collection and so on, you can set up the rules ahead of time uh, for default classifications, default containers and rules around where the content goes. This therefore allows all information that is related from a compliance perspective to be managed in the same container, regardless of where it resides in SharePoint. And this also allows end users the freedom to organize information in SharePoint in the way which they work, but it keeps the records managers happy by managing it in accordance with best practice records management principles. So from a user's point of view, it's a seamless process. SharePoint 
uh, functionality is not affected in any way and they can keep creating this chaos on the SharePoint side. So that is the how the integration manages content. Now let's talk about what we manage when we manage it. We will discuss these together as they go hand in hand. The product provides the ability for users to manually kick off any of the four core processes, so manage, finalize, relocate, archive. They can, for example, select one or more list items, so one or more documents in a document library, and manage them. But requiring users to make those decisions is not always the best approach. Leaving the decision to end users requires them to make the right decision and also to remember to make that decision. This introduces significant risk of human error, adds training cost and can undermine your efforts to govern content. So for those familiar with Records Manager, this is why you turn on, for example, the Office integration. So when users save a drafted document, it goes straight into Trim. It takes that decision process away from the users and, and they don't have to remember to do it. So the better approach with the integration is to automate this process. This ensures that everything that should be managed is, and it ensures that it is managed at the right time. It can also deliver a consistent approach across multiple business units. The integration also includes the ability to automate your compliance rules and therefore largely mitigate the risk of human error. So let's return to the compliance lifecycle. This is managed in HPRM using retention schedules, which anyone using Records Manager or Trim will be familiar with. This is where the rules around retention and destruction can be defined. In SharePoint, the integration provides lifetime management policies, uh, and these govern if and when a record is created and when the content is removed from SharePoint. So remember this term here, lifetime management policies. This is one of the, the best new features in 8.2 and all the capability and flexibility around this. Looking at a more complex lifetime management policy, it is possible to nominate the conditions under which a record is created, uh, the content is finalised, and finally when the content is removed from SharePoint. So you can define quite complex rules. So this finally brings us through the fundamentals here and to the live demonstration of the integration. Uh, just before I kick off any further though, Colin, do we have any questions at this point? Uh, no, John, there's no nothing um, specific at this stage. Excellent. All right, I'll keep going there. This is the bit everyone's been waiting for. So to start with though, here are some of my favourite new features in Records Manager 8.2 uh, that make this the best integration yet. So for those that have used the integration before, uh, you'll see some of these points here. Uh, quite attractive if you're looking at integrating anytime soon. So there's a new app architecture in SharePoint 2013 which the, the integration uses. So that means there's no more server-side installations on SharePoint. Uh, it's a lot cleaner to manage this process as a, as a technical project and get the integration up and running. There's the new lifetime management policy engine. So that's what I mentioned before, the lifetime management policies now have a huge amount of flexibility. They were quite limited in the previous integration versions and you had a very limited number of ways that you could determine when content went into a trim. Uh, there's big changes to deployment and configuration of the integration. It has a centralized configuration by using a default site collection that you determine. It also now supports SharePoint Online and Windows Azure, which a few of our clients are already looking at doing. So that's a big one because not everyone wants to have internally hosted SharePoint environments. So if you want SharePoint Online and all of the hosting issues associated with that being managed by someone else, uh, the integration now supports that. The integration now applies security and access controls um, to the SharePoint content based on what's in Records Manager. It supports OneDrive for Business. It has the new rules-based management, so you determine or set up rules around um, how content is managed. And there's a management details page overhaul, so we get to see more information about um, where a document in SharePoint exists in Records Manager, like what container it's in, uh, and some other metadata um, states as well. So let me just end 
the slides there and I'll jump straight into Internet Explorer here. So just before we jump in, Colin, any other questions at this point? Uh, no, no other questions, John, thanks. Great, okay, I'll jump straight in. So what I've got here is a SharePoint 2013 site. I've just called it a Capish portal. Uh, you've, if you've used SharePoint 2013 before, you see I'm just using the standard theme here. Not very exciting. Now, within SharePoint 2013, if you haven't seen it before, it now has apps for any sort of content you add to the environment. So what I mean by, mean by that is a document library is an app, a calendar would be an app, and a discussion board would be an app, and so on. So you can see here in the middle of the screen, we've got the HPRM governance and compliance app, which I've now added to this site collection. Jumping into the app page here, you can see this is broken up into various sections where we configure the integration at this, this default site level. So the default integration settings, our records management options, which I mentioned, this determines containers, classifications, and so on. Management rules, including instructions, selectors, and options. So this is, this is where we can set some very um, specific rules about what gets managed in SharePoint. Our mapping, so we, how we map content types in SharePoint to record types in Records Manager. And the big one down here now is the lifetime management policies as well. So jumping into the lifetime, lifetime management policies. If you remember using the integration, if, if you have used it from uh, Trim 7.1 to 7.3, you may remember there was some basic lifetime management policies you could apply to a library, such as uh, immediately manage, where you put content into a library and it immediately gets created as a record in Trim. Uh, there was a couple of other options out of the box, but it was quite limited. So this, this is what I was talking about around um, the limited options that you could use to determine when content goes into Trim. Now, this new feature here with the lifetime management policy gives you a huge amount of flexibility. Out of the box immediately, you get a whole bunch of new um, example or baseline management rules. So relocating sites, um, managing draft documents, published documents, immediate management, uh, immediate finalize, and so on. And up the top here, I've actually created a couple um, to manage proposals that I put in a proposals library, which I'll go show you. So to start off with, I'll show you how simple this is for an end user and how little it interferes with the usage and functionality of SharePoint. So I've clicked on a proposals library here. In this library, I've got four documents, four documents. You'll see at the top here, one has a record number, a folder, um, and a folder title. And this is coming from Records Manager. So I can see this document at the top, this end user training plan, is already managed. If I tag this document, you can see in the library controls here, I actually have a Records Manager drop-down menu a bit that you can use if you want to do manual management or if you want to uh, have more advanced users have a bit more control over those four features I mentioned before, manage, finalize, relocate and archive. This is where they can use it. But what I wanted to come and show you is the new management details window. Keep in mind this is a live demo so anything could happen. Good, it's working. <laughs> So what you see in the management details screen here is a lot more information than, than what you had available before. So we can see the following details for this particular document. It has a record number D1556, record type document, the container it's in, the classification it has applied, and the retention schedule applied as well. So we get to see a lot of information here and a big green tick when we know it's managed. I won't go into too many of the other fields at this point. So what about the content under this document here? So we've got a proposal, a user, a power user training session plan, and a statement of work. Now, at this stage, 
I've got a status column here that just says not started. So I haven't done anything with these documents. Uh, just imagine they're templates that have been put in, but no work has been done on this project at this point. But what I may do is go and update the proposal and send this off to a client. At that point, I would say I edit the properties on this document, if I was editing in Word, and I would set the status to be a draft, and I'll just make a comment. Proposal drafted, save, just wait for SharePoint to respond there. So you can see here all I've done is change the status field to say I've now drafted it. Just imagine I've edited the document in Word and made some changes. Now I can go off and do some other work, uh, click around my intranet, check out some discussion boards, come back to my proposals, and what you'll notice here is it's now a record in Records Manager. So I've got a lifetime management policy there to say if there's a proposal in this document library, so it has to have proposal in the, in the title, and the status is draft, it will now manage this item. At this point it is just managed, so that's the first uh, part of that wheel that you saw. So that means it's a record in Records Manager, but the document and the metadata still resides in SharePoint as well. It still has full functionality of SharePoint, so I could edit this document just like normal check-in, check-out, and so on. John, John, sorry to interrupt. Just got a Go quick question regarding the settings that you were looking at before. Just a question about whether those settings were at the site level rather than the root level of the... Yeah, so that was at the site collection level, Yep. yep. the original app settings I was looking at, That's but they true. can be controlled and, and changed at various levels depending on where you add the app. Okay, great. So you, can, so you can determine different rules at different parts of your SharePoint environment. Okay, great, thank you. So coming back to the upgrade proposal here that, that we've um, now drafted, I was going to show you in Records Manager, I've got that container up here, F15.5, I'll expand that out. Now, first of all, you can see the two records here the end user training session plan and the HPRM upgrade proposal. So these two records here, D15, 56 and 57. Now for those of you that have used Records Manager before, you'll notice that the record icon here still just shows like a metadata only record item. Now that's because the, the document still resides in SharePoint. So as I said before, there's no duplication of content at this point. However, for the question that's often often asked then is, well, how does a user in Records Manager view this view this document? Then do they have to go and find it in SharePoint? Well, no, they don't. As a as a user in Records Manager, I can still just double click this record, and it pulls the document from the SharePoint store and opens just as if you had the document attached to the record. So you can see that's a seamless uh, functionality on the Records Manager side as well. However, all the document editing still needs to happen on the SharePoint end. So you can see the metadata only icon there. Now, let's say I've finished this proposal, the HPRM upgrade proposal. I'll make an ed another edit to the status of this document. I'll say that it's now final and save that. So again, nothing out of the ordinary for a user using SharePoint here. I haven't used any integration features. Uh, that status column is just a SharePoint column that I've created. So again, browsing off to read some more discussion posts on the internet, come back to my proposals library, and now what do you see? You see that the proposal draft or final proposal document is now missing. So what's happened here is I've created a management rule to archive the document. So once I've set it as final in SharePoint, at that point, no more editing needs to occur. It's, it's now a finalized document. Nothing else is going to happen with it. So I've set up a management rule to say, move that document to Records Manager. So coming back to Records Manager, you can see 
the document is now attached to D1557 and the edit status is finalized. So you can see that process there uh, being seamless between, between SharePoint and Records Manager. So again, why weren't these other documents affected? That's because I set up the lifetime management policies to specifically target proposals only at this point. This was just to demonstrate uh, a basic example of how you can target specific content and management, uh, manage it to records manager in a specific way. So you can see some flexibility around what you're doing here. In the older integration, you basically set a lifetime management policy for the entire library. So either everything would be um, managed immediately or you'd have to set a flag on a particular document to, to trigger it to go into records manager or trim. But if I want to say relocate or manage or archive and so on one of these documents, I can still do that. So let's say the power user training session plan. I'll use one of the manual features here. In this case, I'll just use relocate. So if you remember what, that, this, what this feature does, it moves it to records manager, but does not finalize it. So it's still an active record. Now what you'll see here on this window, are you sure you want to relocate this item? You will no longer be able to access this item after you do the relocation. Click OK to proceed. What you can see here is based on your records management options or the lifetime management policy rules, you can see where it's going to end up. So the record type it's going to, to use, the container it's going to use and so on. Again, this is a basic example, but you could have lots of other metadata being completed here, or you could have it going to different places within Records Manager, depending on rules that, um, that have been applied. Now, when I click OK, you'll see here that it says a request has been submitted to the job queue. You'll notice that before when I was changing the status of these documents, that it doesn't happen immediately. There's a slight delay. And the reason for that is it, it makes everything a background process so that can you do use SharePoint without having to sit there and wait for a spinning loading icon while this, while this process performs. So I'll click close on there. And it's, in this case, I waited long enough that it's happened straight away. So coming back to Records Manager, you can see there's my power user training plan. And it's currently just checked in, but still editable. And likewise, the statement of work. In this case, let's say I'll finalize. Again, it's not a record at this point, but it will be. Click OK. This time I was quick enough that it hasn't happened straight away. So I'll come back to the proposals library. And we can see that's now a record. The difference with this one, using the finalize option is the document still resides in SharePoint. So we get the metadata only record in records manager, but it's still finalized according to records manager. So remember that records manager is the authority for this record. Now it's saying it's final. Colin, do we have any questions about what I've showed so far? Yeah, John, we have a few. I might ask um, a couple of them now. Just we've got quite a few questions coming in. I'm doing my best, everyone, to try and answer them. Um, so there's a question about when the, the uh, document exists in Records Manager as a metadata-only record. Is there a way to identify easily in Records Manager that there's a SharePoint document attached or associated with it? Absolutely. Good question. So. Coming back to this example here, the statement of work or end user session plan. So I did have this fixed earlier with my view, I might have been using a different client session, but I'll customize the view pane in records manager here. And you'll actually see some SharePoint fields in records manager. So I'll add a SharePoint properties, SharePoint ID, SharePoint URL, just a few different fields here so you can see what we capture. So SharePoint URL is what you could use to determine where this document is and if it exists in SharePoint. So if the SharePoint URL field was blank, 
So I'll click on one of these which is now relocated. You'll see it's empty. Whereas for these metadata only records, you can see the SharePoint site and the library and the document um, file name uh, where it exists in SharePoint. So you know that this is a, a SharePoint um, a SharePoint stored document. The other item you can use as well, and you'll notice this on all four documents that have, uh, all four records that have come from SharePoint, is it has a SharePoint properties field as well. So earlier I mentioned the metadata is always captured. This is where it's captured on this on this field here. So you can view the XML data and you get a huge amount of information. So you can hear me scrolling through there. And this is just for that one document, very basic, but you can see all the field information is captured, uh, the editing history from SharePoint is captured and so on. So that's how you would determine, uh, or one of the many ways you could determine where this document is or if it's a SharePoint record. I'm not sure if there's a column you could add to make that a bit easier, but you can see down here on the view pane that's, that's probably easy enough for most users. It doesn't look like there's a SharePoint list item except for audit. Any other questions there, Colin? Uh, not at this stage, John. Um, just answering a few online, but yeah, you just keep going the presentation, thanks. Great. Uh, so coming back to the integration here, so this was just a, lo uh, a library that I've been showing you so far. One of the other common features which people uh, have used the integration for over the years is exposure of content. So you've got a company organization intranet site and if you want to expose, for example, your, your internal your organization policies, maybe forms for your staff, HR policies, procedural documentation and so on, this is a really common scenario and I've seen this with pretty much every integration project I've worked on. So Records Manager 8.2 brings back an exposure feature. It was, it was missing from the previous version uh, when the initial app integration was developed. And I'll show you how that looks here. So going to this library, Capish Install Guides, you can see I've got a list of PDFs here. And you'll also notice there's a record number. So these are records in Records Manager. I'll, I'll show you where these are. If I can remember the container I put them in. They're in F15 too. So you can see here these PDFs actually exist here in Records Manager. So the documents are attached to the record. So at this point, Records Manager is the authority for these records. So in the example of policies, I can continue to have full control in Records Manager and this is the single source for these documents. And therefore, if I'm exposing these to a library, I know that users are getting the most current policy or version of this document, for example. Now there is a limitation with the exposure. It, it is, it's exposed as read-only. So in this case, it's PDFs, but if it, even if it was a Word document or Excel document, for example, that would be read-only. So you don't have the SharePoint functionality with the exposure feature here, but it is an, a feature you use to, like I said, publicize content to your users. The other option you can use are app parts. So an app part is the new name for, for in older versions of SharePoint called web parts. So in these app parts or web parts, you can add a little widget to a page and you can determine um, you know, various settings for these app parts, what they show, um, whether you can do a records manager search in them, whether you can display um, content relevant to the user that's actually logged into SharePoint and so on. So in this case down here, I've, I've created an app part called recent proposals. You'll see here I've got one record in here, HPRM upgrade proposal created today, and it's D1557, the one that I captured just earlier with the lifetime management policies. And I can click view, and this will open the document up on my other.
the screen. So there's my upgrade proposal. So you can see this is also a way you can publicize content using these app parts. And the other benefit here is you can make these uh, specific to the user that is logged in, as I said, because it actually performs a records manager search with those users' credentials. If we look at what I've actually done with this app part, edit the page. And I'll edit the web part. On the web part properties here, you'll see it's doing a records manager string search. So it's looking for everything, including alternatively contained records in the folder F15.5 and the title has proposal in there. Because what you'll notice if I go to that folder F15.5, there's four documents in there. So I only see this one because it's the only record with proposal in the title. So again, a bit of flexibility with that parts there. You, you're only limited by what you put in your string search in the, in the properties. So you can be really flexible with what you bring back in these, these app parts. I'll just cancel the editing of the page. So again, this is how we can um, display content. One of the other common questions I have, uh, probably before I go on, Colin, any other questions on those features? Uh, yes, again, we've got, a, we've got a couple of common ones I'll try to, to ask. So when, when you finalize or archive a document in SharePoint, is it possible to leave a link behind to the HPRM record in, um, in SharePoint? Not easy, easily, uh, because it, yeah, I'd, I'd have to get Jamie to answer that question. All right, well, um, we, we, we can follow that one up offline, perhaps, but. Um, yeah, I was going to say, like, once, once it's moved from SharePoint, it, it's gone. If you want to re-expose it or leave a stub, you could use Exposure or an app part or, or whatever you want to do there. But at this point, automatically, the metadata um, or the list item, if you remember, gets deleted once it's relocated to Records Manager. Um, so off the top of my head, I don't know, but I'll have to check. Yeah, you could potentially leave a, URL, you, okay. you leave a URL behind using um, Capiche Easy Link, maybe? Would that work? Could you leave a URL you could, for the document? So we require a bit of manual, so if manual you're using, work, Yeah, that's right. So you could leave an Easy Link behind, um, or if you're using the web client, you could use those features too. Yep. So. Any other questions on those SharePoint features? Uh, not for now. Thanks, John. All right, great. So that brings brings us to another feature here, which I wanted to show you as well. Uh, I've showed you the document exposure and the app part, so you can actually publicize content. Now, you may not currently have SharePoint 2013, or you may not have Records Manager 8.2, or you may not be looking at upgrading to it for some time. So as an interim solution or a longer term solution to give you a bit of flexibility with your environment, uh, Capish has developed another tool called WebGrid. And you'll see here, this is this is running in this, this app part here. This looks, if you, if you looked at the, um, the install guides list or the proposal app part down below before, you'll see it looks very similar. So here I've got a column of record numbers, titles for the documents which I can click on, and some other metadata which I can choose to put in here as well. So WebGrid is a solution which you could use if, for example, you're still using SharePoint 2003 even, or, or SharePoint 2010, or you've got a, a various, various versions of Trim which aren't compatible with SharePoint 2013 using the new integration. So this is a, a useful feature to use because, as I said, every single integration project I've ever worked on, people use the exposure feature. So publication of the policies, forms, procedures, um, any other items from uh, Trim as well. So using WebGrid, you can actually achieve this quite easily. Uh, and you have a lot more customizability over, over what you display here. So each column that I've put in here, I had the choice to put these in, how, how, how the columns appear. Uh, I can also click on the column headers here to sort these just as if I was in Trim. So let's uh, reorder the record numbers here. So you can see I can reorder those, uh, sort by date last updated, or if I had different extensions, sort by those as well. 
And we also have flexibility over the, the pagination here. So how, how many items in a page um, and showing the number of items in the page and so on. So you can see if I can click one of these, uh, let's go to the, the word add-in configuration guide. And you can see this opens up from records manager. Any other questions at this point, Colin? I uh, don't have any questions, but I've actually got an answer from Jamie who's uh, answered that question about leaving the hand. <laughs> Jamie, so that one. so the, the, uh, the answer is basically you just leave the list item in place in uh, SharePoint. So it is, it is possible to do that, I guess, is the answer to it. Yeah, I think there was an option um, when you're managing or you can set up the integration to leave the list item, I guess. It's, it's not typically done from the integration projects that I've used. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks I'll for that, Jamie. Glad, glad you're here. <laughs> Just coming back into the app then. Does anyone have any questions on any of the options that we have on screen here? I'll leave those there for a second for people to type up their questions because I've demonstrated the lifetime management policies working, some of the records management options. You could see I was going to a proposals container. Um, I was using specific record types for my documents and so on. So you could see you could see the basics working here and that gives you a hint of the flexibility you have when managing content from SharePoint. So I didn't want to bore everyone with all the all the little details in here, but if anyone has any questions, now's the best time to ask that. John, we do have we do have a lot of questions. Um, I think probably we'll have to follow them up just after the webinar. But thanks, everyone. Keep the questions coming through, and we'll certainly follow them up um, each one of them up individually after the session. Yep. Excellent. Good to see people in getting involved there. All right. So coming back to probably the exposure feature, since that's what a lot of people do do use. If I look at the library that I'm in currently, I can go to the library controls here. You'll see there's a records manager button for the library. So this is where I can set up, as I mentioned before, records management options for this library specifically, uh, any specific mappings if there's custom columns on this library, lifetime management options that are applied here. And this is the item I've been using for the install guides library, the exposed records. So you can see here this is based on a saved search. So everything including alternatively contained in folder F15.2. So again, you have a huge amount of flexibility around what you expose. The old integration basically had a container option. You pick a container and everything in that container gets exposed and possibly subfolders as well. In here, however, you could define particular extensions, uh, if there's any other metadata values you want to uh, search against or multiple folders and so on quite easily. So you're only limited again by what you come up with in your string search. Some of the other exposure options here, you can see we can choose to expose the latest revision, uh, the long-term formats, uh, PDF rendition if it's available and so on. So you get a bit more flexibility around what you're exposing and the content type you're exposed to in the SharePoint side. Now, if you've put in a large string search here and you know, you're confident what you had in Records Manager because hopefully you tested the string search first, but you also have an option here to do a count ahead of time to see how many documents you'll have come back. And you'll see in this case, I'll have 12 documents coming back with this string search. So I'll go back to the library and you'll see I've got my 12 documents here. In the case with the proposals library, if I go into the records manager management options, you'll see this is uh, where we can define some rules for this library. So some of the defaults, uh, the default container that we may use or whether we inherit options from a higher level site. So if you've got a, say, a finance site with lots of subsites, maybe you want to define uh, some of the default finance classifications or containers or maybe owners or home locations and so on. 
Um, if a container doesn't exist, do we create one? Or we can set it to specifically use a container that we've already made ahead of time in Records Manager. Uh, if there's a particular record type we want to use, we can use that. And same with classification. So this, this records management options section, specifically to this library, is where we determine those rules. And I'll show you a bit more detail about the manage the lifetime management policy I actually created there, so you can see how these were working. So the first policy I had in place was I had a proposal. It hadn't been started yet, but once I updated it, I set it to be a draft. You can see down the bottom here, I've got a lifecycle stages section. In here, if I was creating this lifetime management policy, I click add a new stage, and then I determine some rules. So you can see here, this is like a Boolean search in Records Manager. We basically set up a couple of conditions that the rule checks against, against, and then an action that applies to the document. So in this case, I've said, check the status field, and does it say draft? Yes. And does the title contain the word proposal? If that's the case, then manage the item. And you remember those four key features here, manage, finalize, relocate, archive. So I'm basically saying which one of those options I wanna choose so a user doesn't have to remember to go and do it. So that's how the item was managed in that first example. If I go back a page to my policies again, If I look at the finalise lifetime management policy, and I'll click on the rules down the bottom, you can see a similar set of conditions. So is the status final? Yes. Does the title contain proposal? And then I do the archive action. So you can see the flexibility there as well. And again, you can build on these rules and, and set up management rules as well. But I won't go into too much more detail with those. So we're coming up to just a few minutes left on the webinar. Colin. Are there any key questions that you think we can answer quickly? Or do you have any yeah, closing one, words as well? Some questions about the, just before we wrap up, some questions particularly around the licensing. So we've had a, quite a few questions regarding whether uh, a user in SharePoint requires a, a license in HPRM to, for the integration to work. Yep, good question. That's a common question too. So at this point, it depends on the features you want to use, but typically, yes, you do need a license in Records Manager to be able to use the SharePoint functionality. So you want to have um, the seamless integration where users can still edit a managed item, for example, and use SharePoint features without any interruption to their day-to-day their -day process, then yes, a Records Manager license should be used. If you did want to um, say, for example, just use exposure, that's a, that's a different case. You could you could set up the environment to not require people to have a license if you're just exposing content and they come and click on the document, for example. Okay, great. Um, just one other quick one before we wrap up. Um, the, you showed, obviously, different content types. So there's a question here about whether the integration will work with, with other content types like uh, discussion boards, announcements, calendars and wiki pages and other lists. So is there a, a limit to the uh, the capability of integration yep. from that point of view? Good question. It, it, we work with any content type you, you choose. So, so you have an option here called the content types to record types mapping. And if I show you that list, if it loads quickly enough, you can basically map any content type you have in SharePoint. Again, this is just a default SharePoint site that I've set up. So just the default content types. But you can see I could select any content type, including hidden types, to map to a record type in Records Manager. So yes, you can manage anything. Okay, that's great. Um, we do actually have quite a few other questions, John. There's just not going to be time to actually answer them during the session. But like I said, um, we'll certainly follow each of those up individually, make sure everyone gets gets an answer to those. So. Um, yeah, I guess if you if you are interested in finding out more about the Records Manager SharePoint integration or, or any of the Capiche products that we talked about today, uh, you can get in touch with us either at our website at capiche.com.au um, or you can, you can call us on our, our uh, office number 03 9017 4943. 
So before we wrap up, up, wrap up I'd just like to thank John for uh, that excellent presentation and uh, thank you to everyone for, for attending and, and getting involved in the webinar today. I look forward to speaking to you soon. Great. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk very soon. Thanks, Cheers. John.